Welcome. It is my great pleasure to introduce Tamiko Brown Nagan, the Justice Thurgood Marshall Distinguished Professor of Law and Professor of History at the University of Virginia. Professor Brown Nagan holds a PhD in history from Duke University and a law degree from Yale University, where she was an editor of the Yale Law Journal. She received her BA summa cum laude from Furman University. Before joining the faculty at UVA's law school, Professor Brown Nagan practiced law in New York City and served as a law clerk to the Honorable Jane Roth of the United States Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit and to the Honorable Robert L. Carter of the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. At UVA, Professor Brown Nagan teaches constitutional law, constitutional and social history, and education law. She is considered one of the nation's leading young legal historians and has written widely in the areas of legal history, education law, and the Supreme Court's equal protection jurisprudence. Her scholarship has appeared in some of the foremost law journals within the legal academy. In February of this year, Oxford University Press published Professor Brown Nagin's first book, Courage to Dissent, Atlanta and the Long History of the Civil Rights Movement, a socio-legal history about lawyers, courts, and community-based activism during the civil rights era. This highly anticipated work has already garnered widespread acclaim. Most notably for members of our community, the book features some of the lawyers who were integral players in the legal odyssey that ultimately led to the desegregation of the University of Georgia. And this will be the subject of her talk today. If you have questions at the end of her talk, please use the microphones down at the front to ask the questions. And at this time, please join me in welcoming Professor Tamiko Brown Nagan. Good afternoon. Thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction. And to all of you for coming out, it's an honor and a privilege to be here at the uh, University of Georgia, particularly in this uh, 50th anniversary year of the school's desegregation. I want to begin by, uh, of course, thanking the American Constitution Society for inviting me uh, to appear here. Uh, particularly to Ashlyn Johnson, who organized this event. She's worked so hard uh, on bringing this together, and I appreciate that so much. I also want to recognize the co-sponsors of the event, including the uh, Georgia History Department, uh, the African American Cultural Center, the Institute of American African American Studies, and graduate and professional scholars. Thank you all, I'm thrilled to be here with you and I appreciate your support. Now, I wanna begin my talk with a question. And my question is, how many of you are familiar with the work of Thurgood Marshall? By a show of hands, how many of you know who Thurgood Marshall is? Okay, so I see most hands just as I would have anticipated. Uh, many, many people know who Thurgood Marshall is. Uh, he was my childhood hero and a hero to many Americans because of the singular role he played in the legal history of the civil rights movement. Of course, he famously uh, litigated the case that uh, desegregated the schools formally, Brown versus Board of Education, and of course went on to become the nation's first African-American Supreme Court Justice. Because of his role in the legal history of uh, the movement, civil rights movement, many, many books uh, that are written about the legal history of the movement revolve around Thurgood Marshall and his conception of equality. Well, my book is different. It begins with the question of what would the legal history of the civil rights movement look like if the work of Thurgood Marshall and the work of the Supreme Court justices weren't so central to the story? What would we see? Who would we see? And my book answers that question with this observation. If we move those familiar uh, persons and institutions away from the center of analysis, 
we can see unsung lawyers and activists at the local level. People who contributed a lot to the social and legal world that we live in today. People who sometimes disagreed with Thurgood Marshall and his conception of equality. People whom we ought to remember, just as we remember uh, Marshall. And I say that because I think in remembering these people, we add depth to the history of the civil rights movement. Now, my work, my book, Courage to Dissent, recalls the history of uh, the movement in Atlanta. And of course, uh, you all know that Atlanta is a leading American uh, city today, uh, but it was also really important during the civil rights movement because it was the home to uh, leading civil rights organizations. Uh, including uh, the Southern Christian Leadership uh, Council and the and SNCC, um, the student organization, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So, what I'd like to do is focus in particular um, on SNCC and other waves of lawyers and activists who contributed, uh, who are unsung and who contributed to the history of the movement. I take a bottom-up perspective on constitutional law. And what I'd like to do this afternoon is discuss three waves of unsung lawyers and activists uh, who uh, I uh, argue in my book contributed to uh, the civil rights movement in important ways. The first point that I want to emphasize is that all of these dissenters, and I style all of these people dissenters, had the same overarching goal of equality, but they had different priorities and tactics for achieving uh, equality. In fact, they defined equality in different ways. The first wave of dissenters were pragmatists. I call them pragmatists because they wanted to challenge Jim Crow, but without destroying the social and economic capital, that the black middle class had built during segregation. So who were these pragmatists? Well, they were some of the black college presidents in Atlanta, many African-American teachers who were the lion's share of uh, the black middle class, and they also included A.T. Walden, who was one of the South's first African-American lawyers. And here he is, a portrait of Mr. Walden. Now, Walden was the son of former slaves and sharecroppers. He studied at Atlanta University with W.B. Du Bois. He went on to graduate with honors from the University of Michigan Law School. He excelled at Michigan while waiting tables for a lo local fraternity. He is little known today, but Walden really inspired a generation of African-American lawyers, including Vernon Jordan. A um, uh, lawyer, the, the counsel to presidents, uh, whom I'm sure some of you uh, have heard of. Jordan called Walden so impressive. He said, quote, I wanted to be a lawyer just like Walden. I wanted to walk like him and talk like him and hang out my shingle on Auburn Street just like Walden. Above all else, pragmatists like Walden and the black college president prioritized voting rights as the path to black power. And here we see Walden challenging the so-called white primary, uh, the laws, the tradition of excluding uh, African Americans from the vote in Georgia and elsewhere. And here is the result of his activism. In 1946, after the fall of the white primary, blacks lined up all over uh, the streets in Atlanta, eager to exercise the franchise. And yet, Walden and other pragmatists were called accommodationists, Uncle Toms. And so the question is, why would that be? Well, it was because he didn't challenge segregation in housing. Instead, he made deals with local whites to find housing for African Americans wherever he could in the midst of a post-war housing crisis. Um, and this had the effect